Daniel chapter 2 in your Bibles this morning, Daniel chapter number 2, and we're going through the series, Certain Truths for Uncertain Times, and the Certain Truths for Uncertain Times, and uh, certainly, um, Brother James, you could put that slide up there, that'd be great, or whoever's back there, I can't see, I can't, there you go, all right, if you can get that slide up there, that'd be wonderful. Um, Certain truths for uncertain times. And we come to, um, last week we talked through Daniel 2 and then Sunday night we talked about Daniel 3, the fiery furnace. Uh, But there's an element of Daniel chapter 2 that I kind of on purpose raced through. The thrust of the message last Sunday morning was standing um, for the Lord. And this, I, I kind of, I didn't skip through it. Uh, but I skimmed through it. And so I want to go back and dive in on verse 17, if you would. Chapter 2, verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would declare, desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows would not, should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20. This is the immediate response now. Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And then he goes on down through verse 23. We'll stop there for for just a moment. I want you to turn over to Daniel chapter 9, if you will, just for a minute. Daniel chapter 9. And I want to show you what kind of what kind of prayer warrior Daniel was. Um, And the title of the message, A Prayer of Thanksgiving in the Midst of Panic. A Prayer of Thanksgiving in the Midst of Panic. Um, If we've ever seen panic on the face of a society, it is a society in which we're surrounded by. Panic is everywhere. And it has been for eight months now. And... You, I, I was just, I was just reminiscing last night at the business meeting, and then even this morning, um, you know, March fifteenth, we didn't know really what to do, and um, because we we had very little information about the virus, and we still have very little information about the virus, very little information that you can put your foot on. We have a whole lot of information, information overload, but information that you can that you can. Step on, we have very little of that. Um, We even had less of that March 15th. And so we had live stream services. I think we we had a few folks in the building that day, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Um, And then I think we did the same thing Wednesday night. And then uh, Brother Jason uh, Page, he came to the church one day and uh, I want to see if anybody needs some help. And he's very gracious in that. And so we were standing right out here at the bottom of these steps. I think Brother Jason's still here. He was at the nine o'clock. He's got security now at the eleven o'clock. But um, he was at the bottom. He was. We were at the bottom of the steps, and we were just talking casually, you know. And he wanted to meet me, and, and so I, we met, and we were just talking. Well, then all of a sudden he said, "You know what'd be good?" Just kind of in his nonchalant, you know, he's. He's very sharp, but he's country like me. And just in his nonchalant way, he said, you know what would be good if we just pulled up trucks and backed them up in here in the parking lot and just had church that way. I thought, hmm. I don't know about, I don't have a truck to back up and put the tailgate down. I can't get the tailgate down on mine, so I don't know about <laughs> no, just kidding. So I don't know about that. I said, boy, that's a good idea. And so I didn't say nothing. When he, thought, when he, when he said that, my wheels started turning, you know. I thought, man. I think that'd be good. And I called, I called Dylan up and I said, I said, Dylan, you got to go in this parking lot and, and like set this thing up. Like we're going to park. I said, you park, you know, park your car. And I'm going to take a picture of your car parked here. Like we're supposed to park them. And, uh, and so we had outside services from March 22nd through May 19th. Our next service in here, uh, first service back was May 19th. And um, as I got to thinking, I thought, you know, not one time 
Not one time. The only time that it rained was on Easter evening, Sunday evening. It's come a big thunderstorm. And I think Miss Rebecca and uh, y'all was here. Y'all came to that. But we had canceled that evening service and had uh, Narrow Road sing. And it, because I, I thought it was going to be a big old storm. So I thought that'd be the best thing to do. Well, it turned out it really didn't start raining until after we got done anyway. And, uh, but we didn't have that service. Other than that service, and we had some extra services, a good Friday service. We'd never had that before. Had a parking lot full on that. And then had a graduation service. Never done that outside. Never done that here, period. Actually, except for in the 80s when we had the school, I'm sure. And so um, a couple of things. We, we, can you imagine? So from March 22nd to May 19th, we had at least three services a week. And, and the one washes the other one out. So we had at least three services a week. And do you know, it didn't rain on us one time till we, till we left the service. Like, no rain. March is rainy time of the year. We didn't get rained on, but one time, that was barely, that was on the way out. Y'all remember that? It was a Wednesday night. People started filing out. And when they got in the cars, everybody's leaving, it started raining. And you know, God did that. God ordained that conversation I have with Brother Jason. And then Brother Eddie comes up. We got one of them transmitters. I honestly didn't know what I was doing by any of that. Transmitter, trans, what do you need? I don't even know what you're talking about, transmitter. Really, I didn't. When he t told me transmitter, I thought, sounds good, Brother Eddie. You know what you're talking about, transmitter? Yeah, transmitter. Let's do it. I didn't know what that looked like, nothing. I just thought we was going to put speakers out in the concrete and have church. That's all I thought. He started saying transmitter. He said, the guy up at the Christmas trees has got a transmitter we can borrow. I said, okay, borrow a transmitter. What's it going to do to help us? We got speakers. What do we need a transmitter for? We got speakers. Just blow it out right here. And then I figured out it was in the car. I thought, man, it's pretty good. We got church going on in, in the car. We got it. I was, I was sitting in the parking lot just listening to music just to see if it worked. It, and do you know not one time from March 22nd through May 19th, did one fire truck come by? And we live less than 200 yards, 300 yards maybe, from a from firehouse. And the very night we got back in church, you know what came by the front of church? Fire truck. And it dawned on me. Man, in all those services, not one time did a fire truck come by. Or a police car, sheriff car, no car, with sirens on. Come by. You know what happened? God did all that stuff. And we're no better than anybody else, but God's sure been good to us. And Daniel was in a, in a I mean, it was a time of panic. Imagine everybody's going to die. I mean, pretty much the king's mad because nobody can reveal the, the secret, the mystery, the dream to him. So pretty much I'm tired of all of you. It, it's that, you know, uh, it's that dictator mentality. If, if one person can't reveal the dream, I'm going to kill all of you. I'm just all going to be done with annihilate everybody. So Daniel got concerned about his friends, about the people around. And so he said, you know, somebody's got to do something. And so he begins, he begins in verse 17. First, he calls the time out and says, okay, I got an idea. And then he has a, has a prayer meeting. But before that, I want you to look in Daniel 9, verse 21. I want you to see what heaven thinks about Daniel. Chapter 9, verse 21. And Daniel's praying, I mean, awesome prayer. Verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer... Even the man Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Look at verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Now notice verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Notice, at the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. The answer came as soon as you started speaking. 
And he says, by the way, you're greatly beloved in heaven. You're highly favored in heaven. As soon as you started talking, heaven started moving. The angels put on their work clothes when you got to praying, Daniel. I wonder what heaven thinks about your prayer life. Do they know you? How familiar are they with you? Obviously, as soon as he started praying, I mean, he's right there. Black ink on white paper. He's, they came. Heaven paid attention. They started coming. Gabriel came. He said, as soon as you started praying, the commandment came to us. We were given orders because of your prayer. And I wonder, I wonder this morning, in 50 years from now, I wonder if our grandchildren, great-grandchildren can look back. Are they going to blame us for not being serious enough about prayer and stopping impending judgment? Are they, is this church not even going to be around 50 years from now because we failed to pray like we should? Because Daniel had a prayer meeting. He prayed. He got a hold of heaven. He spared all those wizards' lives, basically, and his friends. Because he took prayers, he, he, he stayed the judgment of God because of his prayer. I wonder what we do with our prayers. Like what effective thing happens because you pray? Or do we pray? And certainly this prayer of thanksgiving is instructive to all of us. But we know that God heard the cry of Daniel in chapter 9 and chapter 2. There was certainly panic around everywhere. I mean, they're going to die. There's panic today. George Mueller said this. If our circumstances find us in God, we shall find God in our circumstances. And certainly that's true. But I want you to notice verse 17 again. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And... Then in the actual prayer, he, he, for instance, look at verse 23 at the bottom part. Has now made known unto, what's that? Us. Us. Huh. So they were praying together. They were praying together. You know, praying friends are priceless. Praying friends are priceless. Praying friends will be visible. They'll be there. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we tweet about it and we post it, but do we really pray for people when we say it? We text it. It's a lot easier to text praying for you than it is to actually pray for somebody. It's easier to tweet about it than to do it. It's easier to post it on Facebook to put a little praying hand symbol than it is to actually pray. I wonder how many times that we do that do we actually pray? Praying friends are visible. What does that mean? They'll be there. They're there. Daniel had this, these companions. I did it just this week with, with you know, in a couple of weeks. There's sometimes when, when you have friends, if they're going through something. I know somebody away from here, a good friend of mine, going through something right now. And no fault of his own. No fault of his own. He's just in a, in a deep valley. No fault of his own. You know what people do when they're oxygen to pray? They can't what? They can't speak. I never forget when uh, David, my son David, and Jonathan, their twins, David was on oxygen for two years from birth, from uh, not, not right at birth, but soon thereafter. He was intubated two or three times, but then they had to send him home on oxygen. He was oxygen to pray. We really didn't know it when they sent him home. Uh, you know, he started, he just, his color wasn't right, wasn't, wasn't uh, pink. He was dark color. And uh, then, then obviously, you know, when you're oxygen depraved, you, you turn purple and stuff. So this is before he had oxygen. Can you imagine three kids under three years, uh, under a, a year old, under two, three under two years old, one of them on a hundred foot of cord in a, in a house between 900 and a thousand square feet. And he's running around on a hundred foot of cord and he's got, he's pulling tape down on his eyes. He, he, Dave went around like this all the time. He's hooked on cabinets, counter, everything hooked on there, just pulling it. Look, you'd see his face peep up. There he is. 
you know, that tape rubbing, splat. we had had to put ointment on his face all the time because he, he rubbed raw from that, pulling at it. Can you imagine having a little little fellow on oxygen, you know, 100 foot of cord in your house, concentrated all the time, just running crazy? Not good. So before he had that, I was with him one day, and I noticed he just stepped, started turning colors. And so he kept getting darker, and then he turned purple. And I could tell something wasn't right. And so rather than call EMS, I just thought, you know what, I can get there quicker. I think they can come get me. So I just put him in the seat and we headed that way. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't cry. He didn't say nothing, make no sounds. People, when they're hurting, when they're oxygen depraved spiritually, emotionally, you know what they don't do? They don't always ask for help. When you're drowning, you can't talk much. Can't breathe, right? So what do praying friends do? Sometimes I'm afraid we're so busy we don't notice when somebody is turning blue. We just go about our business. Praying friends are visible. They pay attention. They pay attention. And so I just kind of invited myself and my friend's business. I don't know if I'd have done that. Well, I did it. I said, I'm coming into your business. So you can tell me to get out if you want to. I don't know that I will. But I'm coming. Because I know they, he, he needs something. He needs a friend. He's not going to ask. So I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. I'm going to call. I'm going to bug you. I'm going to text you. I got to make sure you're okay. If he tells me he's good, I'm going to say, no, you're not. What's going on? Sometimes y'all got to understand, don't listen to them I'm good texts. You got to have relate. And I'm not talking about this to anybody. I mean friends. I don't do this to everybody. Somebody will tell you off if you do this to everybody. I'm talking about good friends. Sometimes you just got to walk into a friend's life and you know they're going through something and pray and like invite yourself. Y'all know how to invite yourself. You do it all the time when you're going out to eat. <laughs> invite yourself. Sometimes we got to invite ourselves through prayer, not gossip, for prayer's sake, into somebody's life. And I'm thankful this friend has texted me honestly and openly. Not just, I'm good, I'm fine. Don't you hate to hear that when you know everything's not good and not fine? And we're all good at doing that. I do. If you ask me, I'm good, I'm fine. You know, I'm good. How you doing? Okay. Don't do that. To a good friend now. Praying friends are what? They're visible. And in this instance, they were very valuable because who else was he going to talk to? Nebuchadnezzar knows wizards, sorcerers. Sorcerers don't understand the language of prayer. They didn't understand it. So he, he had... Praying friends are valuable. They're vital. You can't do without them. And so let people, you say, Pastor, what can we do for you? The most beneficial thing you can do for me is to pray for me. And that's the most beneficial thing we can do for anybody. But I, I, want, I want to say to you, you know, you don't attract what you want. Friends, speaking of friends, you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. So to have a praying friend, you got to be a praying friend. You don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. You've heard, you know, teenagers. Either. Well, I like to have a spiritual guy. How hard is it to find a spiritual guy? Well, how about let's be in a spiritual lady and you might find one. You attract what you are, not what you. Some guy says, I like to have a. Spiritual girl. Well, be a spiritual guy and guess what you'll attract? Spiritual girl. Likewise, praying friends. You know how you get one? Be one. Be one. They're vital, they're valuable, they're visible. They're there. And these friends were there. A friend loveth at all times. Proverbs 17, 17 says, and a brother is born for adversity. 
Now, let's dive into this, into this prayer right quick. In verse number 20, he did it in the latter part of verse 19. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. That was his first response. So we see verse 19. Then the secret was revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. What did he do first thing? Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. What did he do in verse 20? Daniel answered. Here's the actual prayer of thanksgiving. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. You know what? If, if you and I were in a situation where we are about to be annihilated, is that the first thing you would pray? I don't know about y'all, but just, you know, without me being instructed, the first thing I may pray was, God save my neck. Save my life. Lord, if you don't do something, we're going to be torn limb by limb by Nebuchadnezzar and his cronies. So God, you got to do something now and uh, you, please help. Oh God, help us. I know you revealed the, the dream to me, but can, you got to make sure he accepts it. God, you got to make sure everything's okay. God, don't you let me die. Those are some of the things I could think of to pray. But what he said is not what I would, outside of instruction from his word, that wouldn't be my first response. His first response was, again, verse 20, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Now he's about to get torn, uh, you know, all, everybody's going to die. And the first thing on his mind is, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Do you know most of our pray, praying is man-centered? Most of our praying is narcissistic. Pastor, what do you mean by narcissistic? Self-serving. Most of our prayers are self-serving. We start and end by praying for ourselves or our family. And now he, he, he kind of does at the end, but he didn't start that way. A prayer of thanksgiving in a time of panic, if you're focusing on each other and you, you know what? You're going to further put yourself in a panic. In the midst of a pandemic, you know what you got to focus on? You got to focus on God. So a prayer of thanksgiving in a time of panic begins with being God-centered. A prayer of thanksgiving must be God-centered. He says, what does he say? Blessed be the what? Of God. The name of God. What does Jesus say? John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. I'm glad there's life through the name of Jesus Christ. Everlasting life, not just life, everlasting life, eternal life through the name, not just any name. There's only one name. And matter of fact, you hear people on uh, social media, see people on television for years. I just thank God. I just want to thank God, you know, after they just seen some vulgar, immoral thing and just want to thank God. They're not talking to the same ones we're talking to. And really, if you mention deity in general, you'll be fine in this life. You mention deity in a general terms, you'll be fine. I'll never go to jail for mentioning deity in general terms. But when you start saying, I just want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ. And you narrow the focus, then things start changing. If you ever notice things change, that's when they turn the camera off. That's when they, uh, they uh, uh, accidentally hit mute right quick is when you began invoking the name of Jesus Christ because there is power in that name. There is life, everlasting life in that name. He said there's life in the name of the Son of God. And then John 12, 28, Father, glorify, this is Jesus speaking now, Father, glorify thy what? Thy name. Then came their voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Do you know the chief goal of man? You know the purpose for which you were created in a general sense? There's only one. You were created to bring glory to Jesus Christ. To glorify him. And so he begins the prayer with blessing the name of God forever and ever. And in the Lord's prayer, how does it start? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed. 
be thy name. He didn't start out, give us this day our daily bread. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And much of our praying is self-serving. And I want to submit to you this morning, hey, let's begin, let's begin praying biblically and beseeching the God and, and ascribing to him the glory and honor that he deserves. Ascribing to him, as he'll mention in a moment, the wisdom and the power and the might that he deserves and, and the fact that he delivered them. He praises him then for that about how you gave us knowledge here and you helped us through this situation. He praises, but he first starts with the character of God. I'm afraid if some of us had to pray and start speaking about what we know about God, it would be a short prayer. May God help us to get back to when we pray, not just pray for self-service. God's not just an errand boy. He's not just a waiter. He's God. And when we beseech him, let's beseech him humbly. But let's beseech him and give glory and honor to who he is. And that's what he did. He said, blessed be your name, Jehovah. And then he, he just starts praising God for who God is, not for what you can do for me. But we got to change the trend of our society. I mean, our, our goal in society now is whatever you can do for me, God, I, I love you as long as you can do something for me. As long as you can heal my family, I love you. As long as you can heal me, I love you. As long as you can make the money go to the end of the month, I love you. But when's the last time you just started your prayer of thanksgiving with not just thanking him for the food you ate or the car you drove or the clothes you had on your back or the roof you had over your head. Uh, you, and that's wonderful. But when's the last time you started your prayer of thanksgiving? Blessed be your name forever and ever. And just talking to God about his character is what Daniel did. And he said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. You know, the Hebrew word there for, uh, is one word for forever and ever. Um, the pagans used that alarm to greet their pagan king. And by it, they would mean that he might live forever. I got news for you. There is no that he might live forever. Daniel puts this same title, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Revelation 5, we're going to be blessing his name forever and all eternity. And he says, I want you to know that this is not some temporary that might live forever. This is an eternal God and we're going to praise him forever and ever. And he's going to be alive forever and ever. And he's going to take care of us forever and ever. Aren't you glad about the eternality of God? And then he mentions in verse 20, again, for wisdom and might are his. Now look down at verse 23. He starts the, the prayer of thanksgiving with ascribing to God wisdom and might. And then verse 23, he ends. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might. You know, uh, the, the entire book reveals, the entire book of this, uh, of Daniel reveals the wisdom and power of God, uh, evidence of his power in controlling the events. And then he goes down and talks about it. And we mentioned it briefly last week, but the times and seasons, he's in control of that. Uh, he determines when history happens, what will happen in history, how it will happen, how long each event takes place, each process or phase of history. Do you know there's a God in heaven that controls that? He's in charge of it. Absolutely. And this is evidence of his power. He controls the destinies of the nations. He sets up kings. He disposes kings. And uh, certainly he will. And uh, so Daniel identified these evidences of God's wisdom and is praising him because of his wisdom. You know, our times are in God's hands. So our praying needs to be God centered. His wisdom, his might, his power, his sovereignty. We need to speak to God's sovereignty. Uh, you know, this, this one preacher told this story, and I may have told it here, I can't remember. He's talking about the doctrine of sovereignty, the fact that God is in uh, control. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't have a God of luck, chance, uh, or fate. And you, you can't have God and then luck, chance, fate over here. 
Those two don't mingle together. You can have a God who's in control or you can, have, you can believe in luck, chance, and fate. Why does believe fate brought us together? No, God brought you together. And if it's a bad situation, you and your sinful flesh brought y'all together. <laughs> Amen. God, God did it. God did it. No chance. You can't have both. There's one cowboy. He was applying for health insurance. And uh, I won't say anything about health insurance. I'm asking the Lord to help me through the Holy Spirit right now. He's helping me and I'm not going to say it. The cowboy applied for health insurance. And you know how this agent, this agent did. He said, he asked him, he said, uh, he said, I got a few questions for you. He said, have you had any accidents in the previous year? His old cowboy replied, he said, nope, sure hadn't. He said, but I was bit by a rattlesnake and this old horse kicked me in the ribs. He said, I was laid up for a while on that. And the agent said, well, sir, weren't those accidents? He said, no. He said, they did it on purpose. <laughs> they did it on purpose. God orders our life. And you may look out and say, man, God, if you're in control, this is a mess going on right now. You know the most peaceful thing I've done in the last three days is not look at the news. What's happening in Michigan? I don't know. Pennsylvania? Don't know. Nevada? Don't know. I know what's happening in Daniel chapter number two here. <laughs> and be careful not to let your ingestion of news affect your spirit. It will. It will. God's in control and I'm thankful for it. You know, God's sovereignty overrules every calamity. It does. God is in charge. You say, how do you say God's sovereignty overrules calamity? Just, just think back to our history for a moment. And those of you, uh, who, who was here and who was, who was born 1931 or before? Did you raise your hand if you were born? 31, 4. Anybody? Brother James, he was around. Who was born 1933 or, or after? Anybody there? Okay. All right. I won't say your name. Give them the age of right. I don't give the age of right, right? So you remember, and some of you may not, you may never heard this, some of you may. The way they change the history books now, I don't know what people hear in history class or what they don't hear in history class. But um, Winston Churchill, prime minister, of course, and then President Franklin Roosevelt, they both about died before World War II. Churchill was struck by a car on Fifth Avenue in New York and nearly killed. Could have died. In Miami in December 1933, an assassin's bullet missed Roosevelt and hit a guy standing beside him. Killed him. Um, both those leaders were spared what could have been the end of their life. The car wreck, the bullet that killed the guy beside him. Can anybody tell me why that was significant? Both of those people teamed up against who that was very significant. Somebody say Hitler. Yeah. Who did that? God did that. Do you know who's at work right now? God. You know who's at work while you sleep? God. And so Daniel is ascribing to God praise for your wisdom, your power, your sovereignty, your name. Your name is above all. And just, just going into a dialogue about God's character. And he's punching the pagan gods along the way with the times and seasons and the setting up kings and tearing down kings in contrast to their armies. So he's really punching them a little bit in his prayer too. Uh, but he's, he's ascribing to God what they are not. And just, just devoting his prayer of thanksgiving in a time of panic. You know, in this day, we would do well to spend more time in prayer and thanksgiving. Just thanking God for who he is. Not, not even, you don't even have to add anything after that. But he certainly does. In verse 23, 
he, he adds it. He says, oh, the, oh, thou God of my fathers. In other words, the God, he, now he's describing his faithfulness. All, all this prayer is about God. The God of my fathers. What is he saying there? The covenant keeping God. The God of Abraham. And by the way, Daniel is standing right now where Abraham left. Where did Abraham leave? Ur of the Chaldees. That's where he's at right Daniel's at right now. So he's describing to God, thank you for your faithfulness. The covenant keeping God of my fathers. You who kept my fathers and those before me, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. And looking back over time, and as I mentioned in the front of the sermon, how I just, just thinking about all the minor details that I wouldn't, that I would just kind of brush over and not really focus, and just to think and to see how God's paintbrush paints and the faithfulness of God is seen so vividly in the colors and the sovereignty of God is seen so vividly in the covers, uh, in the colors uh, of the picture picture that he is painting and his might is seen and his wisdom is seen and his power is seen and his knowledge is seen and boy when you when you see the full picture of God and his faithfulness and his sovereignty it should evoke praise to God and so a prayer of thanksgiving in the time of panic is possible it is possible but it's not possible if you focus on CNN NBC CBS and ABC it's possible if you focus on the God of heaven and what's, what he's doing in your life and what he wants to do in your life. He said, so I, I thank you for the fact that you, you've been faithful to my fathers. And you've been faithful to me. You've made known to me what we desired of thee. You answered my prayer for thou hast now made known unto us the king's manner. And then he went in and wanted to tell the king. I wonder how much of our praying, if you took out you in your prayer life, how much would be left? If you took you out of the picture of your prayers, you and your family, you just took them out. I don't mean you praying, I mean the, the petition about you or your family. How much prayer will be left if you took those out? How much will be left? And then what kind of praying friend are you? He had somebody he can count on. Are you somebody that can be counted on? To be fervent in prayer? And during this season of Thanksgiving, may God help us to focus our attention not on our little world, but on the goodness of God.